please, and turn to Galatians chapter 3 once again. Uh, things change. I, I was going to spend two weeks in Galatians. I think I'm in my fourth. It's Galatians 3. I think I'm in my fourth or fifth week in the chapter. But there's a lot of stuff packed in here, is there not? And with passion, emotion, and logic, Paul has been making a case for a gospel of grace throughout this wonderful New Testament book. Remember, he started off marveling at his reader's desire to go back to the bondage of rules and ritual. He denounced the false gospel of works, and he reminded them of his testimony and of theirs, of his story with Jesus and theirs as well, because he had been intimately involved with that story. And he has contrasted law and grace again and again, and and now at the end of the third chapter, he gets to the point of it all. This wasn't just about giving people a bunch of head knowledge. This isn't theology, it's more liveology. It, it's not just something that we want to be able to believe so we can impress people with our knowledge. It isn't to win an argument or to win a debate. It isn't theology for theology's sake. Uh, those things have their place for sure. But the apostle wants his audience to recognize God's reason for law and grace the end result of the history of salvation that began in the Old Testament and climaxed with the death, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus, who is the Christ. Quite frankly, that's what we should want too. And so Galatians 3, 26 to 29 is our text, and we will go to the heart of the matter this morning. But let's pray again one more time before we do that. And thank you. Father, that we can come before you in Jesus' name through the power of the Spirit who indwells us. Thank you that we have the Word of God, which is forever established in heaven, which is your love letter to us, which is a living book without contradiction or errors in the original manuscripts. We have this Scripture, and you have, you have sustained it, and you have kept it and guarded it for us so that we can have a confidence today that what we are about to see, what we are about to hear, is the Word of God. And that's huge, because everyone has an opinion, and everyone has an idea. A lot of people have a website, but this is truth, and it's not relative, it's real. I pray, Father God, you'd help us to make changes to our life by that same Spirit who indwells us, because as we see ourselves in the mirror of your Word, and as we see you, Father God, would you help us to make the changes in our lives that we need, and we ask it in Jesus' name, amen. Galatians 3, 26. Through 29, for you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. And so the message of the Christian life. Here's where we've been heading to all along. This is what Paul wanted to say. He had to get through the other things, and they were all important and foundational and preparatory. But the heart of the matter is right here in verse 26. You are all sons of God. You are sons of God. And I need you to take a moment to think about what that means. I need you to recognize that this is not about which church you go to, what you wear for church, what you used to do, what the other churches are doing. It's not about what you saw on TV this morning. It's not about even sometimes the feelings or the thoughts because our emotions can't be trusted. There is this statement of fact, and this is where God is taking us. You are his child. You are a son of God. And that needs to be important. I mean, what else could you you want to hear this morning, right? Anything less than that, if I told you you got a million dollars, well, that's only good until you start spending it. If I told you you got great health, you've only got great health until you don't. But you are sons of God. That is something that is eternal. That is a gift from God. And he said it in the present tense. It isn't something we attain to. It isn't something we may sometimes get to. When we trusted in Christ, everlasting life started right then. You don't have to die first to to get everlasting life. When you pray to receive Christ, you were part of the family. You are a son of God, placed as an adult son and, and adopted into his forever family. And that's the heart of the matter. We're no longer children supervised by an impersonal governor. We are full-grown sons of a loving, heavenly father. Now, I've read that some people are offended that Paul uses the word sons. And there are women in the audience who might feel that's a bit I don't know. Dare we say the word sexist in the pulpit? But sonship in the Greco-Roman world meant something. It spoke of a certain status, 
a right of inheritance. That's why verse 29, that we are heirs, right? That we have an inheritance. It connects us with the Son in a way that nothing else could. Look at chapter 4, 4. But when the fullness of the time had come, God sent forth His Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent forth the Spirit of His Son into your hearts, crying out, Abba, Father. Therefore, you are no longer under a slave, no longer a slave, rather, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. And I'm borrowing from next week's text, but that's a good place to borrow, isn't it? We are sons of God, and it means something, and it's important. You see, it was revolutionary stuff in that culture. Back then, women were seen as absolutely inferior to men. They couldn't be legal heirs. They couldn't inherit property. They couldn't lead. Only sons could do that. Only sons could live free. But the gospel says, but the gospel says we are all sons. We are all heirs. This is the heart of the matter. And it's radically counterculture even today. So women, what God is saying here is that the most important thing in that day was to be a son and you're there. Don't be offended. Rejoice that you are included, that you are equal before God, that we are equal before God. And by the way, men, what does the Bible call the Church of Christ in connection to Jesus? He is the bridegroom and we're the bride. Any guys offended that you call the bride? Yeah, I didn't think so. So that's okay, right? Guys can be a bride. And ladies, you can be sons. Sons of God. Sons of God through faith in Christ. What an amazing thing to be lifted up, all of us, into a place we didn't deserve. Carved out for us before, before time began from eternity itself. Now, of course, something as wonderful as spiritual sonship is neither universal nor automatic. We aren't all sons of God. You don't become an heir of God through your own first birth, but through his second birth. So I want you to see here that belief, faith, introduces us to Christ. And we said in verse 26, For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. If you stop that, you are all sons of God, that would be universalism. But we don't believe in universalism, that everybody is automatically going, we're all you know, brothers, God is our father, brothers all are we. No, 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 no. But we are sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. Remember, we're saved by grace. That's God's part. God's part through faith, and that's ours. As we know, we cannot be saved without the personal exercise of faith and faith alone. Good works don't count. Performance doesn't cut it. It's believe, not behave. So what's Paul doing with verse 27? Look at 27 again. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Now, I've been studying this quite a lot, as you can, can imagine, probably. In fact, that's the reason we're not going into chapter 4 yet, because there's a lot, there's a lot to, to get out of chapter 3. Galatians 3.27 is one of the key verses used by those who believe in something called baptismal regeneration. They believe that we are saved by faith and being baptized. And they use this verse. Now, it is very poor exegesis of Scripture to do so, because we know clearly the whole point of the book of Galatians was that it wasn't works, and baptism is a work. It wasn't the law. It wasn't performance at all. How much clearer do we need than 2.16? Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Christ Jesus, that we might be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. How can you look at that verse and the next chapter say, except for this particular wet work? And so Galatians 3.27 does not speak of being saved by baptism. But the question there, is it spirit baptism or is it water baptism? And you could go either way, and good people have. Not, not for salvation. Now remember, we know, we all agree, Scripture is clear that we're not saved. So, by, by water, by anything else besides faith in Christ. But we wonder here, what is the teaching of verse 27? And I believe that, that, that belief introduces us to Christ, but that believers' baptism incorporates us into the church. And I believe, I believe currently that verse 27 is speaking of water baptism, not to save us, because we saw 2.16, we saw the rest of the book, we see the rest of the Bible, but that there is an important part in, in the water baptism that, that associates us with the church. 
that, that initiates us into the body, that, that helps us to, to become uh, fully engaged in the corporate coming together of Christ's body. And so baptism in the New Testament is, is given as the capstone of the process by which an already saved person is initiated into the body. We are introduced to Christ by faith alone, and then we are introduced to the family by the evidence, by the outward declaration of what's happened internally. You see, words are, words are nice, right? Thoughts are nice. But I can think something all day long. If I don't put it into words, it doesn't benefit you at all. You have no idea what I'm thinking because I kept everything locked inside my head. Same thing here. You can believe and you are saved by faith, but there's got to be some representation, some recognition, some declaration, or I won't know, the people around you won't know, because we're saved by internal things. Faith and repentance. And yet, how do I know what's happening in your heart? except by what would happen in your life. Now, it's interesting because have you ever wondered why in the Great Commission the two are, are, are mentioned together, linked? Go, therefore, make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Why is that even there? Because it's significant. He says, make disciples. That's salvation. You're saved before you get to the comma. But then the baptizing part would be that aspect of of making clear to others, of bringing us into a, a community of believers. And he says in verse 27, back in Galatians 3, he says here, For as many of you as were baptized have put on Christ. And so we have the importance of recognizing that believing saves us. Baptism doesn't save anybody. And in the first century, however, baptism, the word was used as kind of shorthand for conversion itself. Because that was, listen, that was the only way they knew. You have to understand that the, the new religion, people of the way, because Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. People said, that's, that's the way. It was seen as a cult. It was seen as a personality cult because they loved this Jesus guy. And if you believed that, you were going against orthodoxy, against your faith, against everything that everybody knew was true. You were committing yourself to a person who was publicly humiliated on a cross. And so it meant something to say yes to Jesus. It meant you were going to suffer. And so the new church, the new believers in the first century and through Paul's day, the first thing they did after trusting in Christ was to get baptized. And they were saying, I am a child of God. Because your baptism points unmistakably to your salvation in Christ. You're committing yourself, you're identifying yourself with the one who was Baptized, or who rather who who died, was put in the ground, who was resurrected and walked, and that's what baptism does. It's a picture of what has happened inwardly, and so in that way we are associating with Christ. We are putting on Christ. So conversion is internal, but then there is the opportunity and the responsibility for us to to say something. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. The Scripture says. In the New Testament church, uh, baptism was not optional. It was expected. The first thing you did after trusting in Christ was to baptize. So on the day of Pentecost, those who the Bible says those who gladly received the word of, of the gospel, Acts chapter 2, were baptized. 3,000 strong. In Acts chapter 8, the Ethiopian eunuch said this, I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. That's verse 37. And in verse 38, he was baptized in that name. Peter had the same experience with Cornelius in Acts chapter 10. And Paul with the Philippian jailer in Acts chapter 16. I'm going to show you that one. So the jailer comes and says, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? So they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. That's categorical. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. The dots there are because you, you and your household. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him, and immediately he and all his family were baptized. And so he said, what must I do to be saved? It's not baptism, it's belief. But because you're believing, because you have trusted in Christ, the first thing you want to do is tell somebody. Show somebody. Make the internal external. Don't, don't keep that thing locked away inside your head. Great thoughts, unexpressed are not great thoughts. Great faith, not shown, is not great faith. And so I believe that you don't, do not have to be baptized. 
perish the thought that goes against Scripture. It is an anathema. But I believe that you will because you want to. Baptism is a rite. The Old Covenant had an initiation rite. What was that, by the way? Old Testament Covenant? Circumcision. Right. Circumcision. The New Covenant has a rite as well, and that's believer's baptism. Now, I say believer's baptism because it's not infant baptism, right? Because there's a, a, a child, a baby, has no act of the will. They're not doing anything. It's being done to them, right? There's no faith being expressed by a baby. So we're talking about believer's baptism at a place in your life when you're old enough to understand, when you've trusted in Christ, when you can stand up here in our case or by the lake or in the Jordan River and say, I'm a child of God. I love Jesus. The water ain't doing anything for me. It's Jesus first. Jesus only. Jesus is my everything. And I'm willing to go through this ritual, this rite, in order to proclaim what has happened, to declare what has been done. It's a beautiful, it's a beautiful rite because it, it, baptism says unmistakably, categorically, without question, I identify with Christ. He is the most important. And it's also then a responsibility. And again, you can have that idea, but if you don't put it into words, no one knows about it. And, and you can have that belief, but if it remains hidden, undeclared, and unknown to others, then are we fulfilling, look at this verse, are we fulfilling Romans 10, 9, and 10? Now, you know all these verses. You love these verses. Would you read them with me? That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth salvation is made unto uh, confession is made unto salvation. Now, you've read those verses before. Tell me you haven't wondered about that. If you believe and if you confess, you're saved. So if I don't believe, if I do believe but I don't confess, am I really saved? Trick question. No one's going to answer, right? If I believe only, I'm saved. But I won't. Listen, I won't believe only. If you're really saved, you will tell somebody. You will confess it. And nowadays, how do we do that? Somebody prays to receive Christ, and the pastor says, Walk the aisle, the sawdust trail. Come forward and, and declare to all these people that you're truly saved. You know how they did it in the church in the beginning? They didn't have aisles. They didn't have Billy Graham. They didn't have, you know, the choir in the background singing just as I am. And so they would immediately, they'd get saved, and they'd say, why shouldn't I get baptized? Bingo, you should. And they did. So what I'm trying to say to you is that when we get saved, we're, we're saved by belief in our heart. That's where salvation happens. But because of that, we want to show. We want to speak. We want to confess. We want to testify. If you can't drag somebody's testimony out of them, then there might be a problem with their foundation. Because you know something? That should be the thing you want to talk about the most, even more than those wonderful grandkids, right? More than the weather, more than your favorite sports team. We should want to say, you might be scared. I understand that. You might gulp a little bit. I get that. But if somebody asked you, you would say, um, I, I believe in Jesus. That's it. You don't have to give theology. You don't have to give a three-point alliterated sermon. But to be able to say, Jesus is my King. Jesus is my Lord. It's all about Jesus. That's the idea, to be able to say, it's not me. And so I want you to recognize again, please hear me saying this, confession is part of conversion, not because it provides it, but because it proclaims it. Let me say it again. Baptism is not part of conversion. Confession is not part of conversion, not because it doesn't provide it, but it proclaims it. More than 60 times in the New Testament, the gospel is given and people are saved, and there's no mention of baptism. 60 times, because you're not saved by baptism. But because you're saved, you're looking for opportunities to let the whole world know. Let the, let the, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. And if you haven't got aisles in your house, the best way is to go next door to your neighbor and just say, hey, Jesus is important. I was thinking about that this morning as we were putting my religious rags on, my godly garments. So I had my suit and my tie and my shiny slip on the ice shoes. And I put my overcoat so it gets worn once a week only in the, in the warm, the cold weather only. And I thought about that as my wife and I went out to the car. I thought about the neighbor, and I know my neighbors too. And I'm wondering what they're thinking about. You know, every week, the same time, we're pretty consistent on our time. Got to get here for Sunday school. I thought, what are they thinking about when they see us going? My neighbors say to me when I'm out running, 
How's it going, Reverend? So they kind of know who I am, right? Um, and as they're helping to me to try to shovel my yard or, or snow throw or snow blow or whatever you do with snow, they know who I am. But I've wondered about that before. What is it that tells them who I am? You know something? It's not just because I'm wearing the garments. It's because of how I live my life. Amen? What you do, what they see in your life, what kind of a neighbor am I? Have I shared the gospel with them? Have I tried to get to know them? So we have this wonderful opportunity to show what is happening. So I believe, I believe that in verse 27, it's actually speaking of uh, water baptism, not to save us, but to, to associate us with those who have trusted in Christ. Otherwise, we don't know. That's where I'm at. Now, some people believe it's spirit baptism, and that's fine too. 1 Corinthians 12, 13, For by one spirit have we all been baptized into one body, whether Jew or, or Greek, free or, or bondage, right? So we do have a spiritual baptism. But the thing is, in 1 Corinthians 12, it's in the past tense. When you got saved, you were baptized. Those that are looking for a second experience are going to look in vain because when you were saved, you were baptized right then. You were placed into the body. You were plunged in. You weren't dipped. You weren't sprinkled. You were plunged in, and you didn't come out. You drowned in Jesus. That's the meaning of baptized, by the way. I don't tell my people that, that I'm going to baptize. But um, in, in baptism, spiritually, you don't come back out. You're in. Uh, you're in. You're in Jesus. But that's past tense. And yet in Romans 13, 14, we're going to look at it in a moment, he says, but put on Jesus Christ that you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. So help me out here, folks. If spiritual baptism has happened already, Corinthians were the most carnal Christians in the Bible. I think I can say that categorically. And Paul said to them, you have been baptized in the Spirit. You've been baptized without water, right? That was spirit baptism. But then in Romans, he says, now, and, 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 by, and by doing that, you put on Christ. Now he says, I want you to put on Christ. See, my friends, that, that can't be talking about something that already happened. There's something else going on here. And what an opportunity for us to say, I'm a child of God. I love it. I was, my grandkids like to go on adventures. And so the adventure always means going up this way, right? There was, there was a this way. Did you know there was a this way behind the sanctuary? And so there's, um, and there's levels. There's levels of, uh, of, of floor. And they always look at the place and they say, yeah, that's where, uh, that's where mommy was. I think they had dunked. I don't know what the, the theological word was. Um, but, you know, and I say, yeah, and someday maybe you can do that. When, if you're loving Jesus and you, you want him to, you want to tell people that you're, I use, I use every opportunity I can, right? So it's a beautiful thing. Now, there's a metaphor of the Christian life that I love here in verse 27 as well. The idea of putting on Christ. Um, clothing is a favorite Pauline image. In Ephesians, he says, put on the new man. Here, Paul likens Christ himself to a garment and, and salvation um, and, and, and walking with him. Be clothed with him. So let's talk about clothing. What does it mean to put on Christ? Well, what does it mean to put on your clothes? It means that we're always associated with him. Clothing tells people who we are. Right? So if I'm going out with uh, running shorts and running shoes, um, it's not a pretty picture, but so try not to picture that, but me in you know, shorts and a, and a T-shirt, the people probably say around me, he's not going to church today. Because your uniform tells you something about it, right? And so we, we wear things, and we, we know that we're doing. We're associating with somebody or something, our gender, our social class, our group. It's what people see first. With the Jesus clothing, people see him. And they say, that's the ultimate authority in that guy's life. That's the person who means the most to that gal. So to put on Christ means that we are always associated. We are Christians, right? Little Christ. It also means that we are always aware of him. Of all your possessions, what do you keep closest to your body on a regular day? It's your clothing, right? Your clothing, I hope. Our clothing is closest to us. The rest of the possessions we take with us, we put in a, in a bag or a box or a briefcase or a pocket. But the idea here is that being putting on Christ, that he's the closest thing to us. Where we go, our clothing goes. With Christ as our ever-present garment, we are closest to him. We are depending on him every moment of every day. Think about that. Putting on your clothing means always with you throughout the day. Jesus needs to be that way. He's closest to us. He is always with us. I see a third thing here. Putting on Christ, putting on clothes, speaks that we are always to act 
like him. We are to always act like him. It means that we are putting on his virtues and his actions. If you are putting on Christ, you should not put on something in your life that's inconsistent with Christ. If I put on a police uniform, I shouldn't be a criminal. If I put on um, uh, the wrong uh, costume, it, it sets the tone for what I do. And I would like you to look at Colossians chapter 3. It's just a couple of books over, right? Uh, Colossians 3.12. And I want you to see in Colossians 3, please, that this isn't, this is the result of putting on Christ. If you put on Christ, you'll put on the things that are of Christ. And that's why they say, what would Jesus do? You're just living for Jesus and you do them. It's not like a list you make. If you're abiding in Christ and you're wearing, you're putting on Christ, this will be the result. Verse 12. Therefore, as the chosen, the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies. Put on kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering. Doesn't that sound like Jesus' clothes? Bearing with one another, forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so also you must do. Why? Because you're wearing the Jesus clothes. And if he did it, you should do it. But above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection. So what's the overcoat in your attire, your spiritual attire? Love. Above all these things, the overcoat of love, and let the peace of God rule in your hearts, verse 15 continues, to which also you were called in one body, and be thankful while you're at it. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Amen. That's the Jesus clothes. And that's better than Gap, Abercrombie, or any of the rest of those crazy names that I can't pronounce or remember. You're a real fashion statement if you're putting on Jesus, because that's what you got right there. Wouldn't it be great if we were known for those things? And so the people see you living that way, and they say, what's different about you? And you say, ready? Jesus. Just wearing the clothes. I'm, I'm Jesus. That's why the Bible, the people talk about being Jesus to others. That's what it's talking about. Not in a hoity-toity, judgmental, I'm better than you way. But these things right here. So people will see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. They will see you living this life and they will ask you a question. And you get to tell them at that moment what's there for whatever you do, word or deed. Do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, whom you have put on. That's why I said Romans 13, 14 says, Put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill it in its lust. So when you're wearing the Jesus clothes, you're wanting the Jesus life. And one more thing. I believe that if we're putting on Christ, it helps us that we are always accepted by him. That we're accepted. Clothing is part of our adornment. How many people, maybe some of you guys, but I don't know, how many people get up in the morning and want to look as ugly as you can? I look really bad in that color. I'm going to wear it. Uh, that makes me look fat. I'm going to put it on. I mean, let's just be honest. Don't you want to look your best? And if somebody comes to your house and you're not looking your best, you, you didn't plan on visitors, you might be a little bit, oh, pastors wear jeans or, you know, um, sweats. You know what I mean? It's the idea of it's an adornment. You look your best. We take time primping. And guys, I know it's not just the gals. Because uh, guys also primp. We want to look a certain way. And here's the thing. When you put on Jesus, you make him look good, and it makes us look good in his, in his shadow or in his, uh, in his uh, glow, his glow, the word I want. Do you know that God has been providing clothes to cover man's shame ever since the Garden of Eden? And when we have Jesus on, you don't see the shame, you don't see the sin, you don't see the selfishness, you see him. And so wearing Christ should remind us of how much we are loved by him. Because when the Father looks at us, what does he see? He sees his son. He sees his son. Now, I want people around us to say, like in the New Testament, remember, there was people that had been with Jesus, and some other people came, and they took notice of them, right? What? They had been with Jesus. Don't you want people to say, oh, you must have been at church today. Or you must have loved something different than I love. What is that? You must have won a million dollars. Oh, I got something better. I'm a son of God. Well, you must have gotten won the lottery. No, I'll tell you what. Jesus saved you. Don't think that doesn't happen in your life, because it can. 
And so I want you to see that there's a metaphor, and it's a beautiful metaphor. And I want you to see that there's a message. You are sons of God. And we'll look at more of that, Lord willing, next week. But what's the meaning of the Christian life? Finally, Paul makes it clear that, the listen, the Jesus clothes are the same for everybody. Everybody who comes to Christ is saved and looks the same. How we live our lives is faithfulness, and we need to be faithful there. But, listen... The redemptive raiment of salvation, one size fits all. We are all united together. The Church of Jesus Christ is a perfect unity with no one better than anyone else. And we see that in the final verses here. I want to see that the body of Christ, the body of Christ is a diverse body. Even though we're in Christ, we're one in Christ, we aren't interchangeable. Aren't you thankful for that? We are so unique. If I call you a unique person, please don't be offended, because it can be used, you know, in a, as a pejorative. But I mean it. You are special. You're amazing. Each one of us, there's something different about us, several things about us. There are distinctions in the body, differences in skin color, ethnicity, gender, age, experience, social class, right? These things are obvious. We don't lose our uniqueness when we come to Christ. Who you are is who, who you were is who you are. God wants us to celebrate our diversity. We don't become, you know, one particular group. The, the, the Gentiles didn't have to become Jews to be saved. So there are distinctions. There are also duties that are different, right? Sometimes look at Ephesians 5 and 6, and you'll see separate addresses to men, right? To the men, I say this. To the wives, I say this. Children, obey your parents. It doesn't say, you know, that we should obey our bosses. It says, children, obey parents. But then it talks to bond servants. And it talks to masters. And I love these verses. Can you read this with me? 1 Corinthians 12, 4 to 6. Because in the scripture, as you know, the Lord takes the, the Christian body and compares it to a human body. To a human body. I remember one time the, the, the uh, Gaithers were doing their thing. They were singing and they were harmonizing and they were joking. And, and they were talking about Bill Gaither's big nose. Who knew? I mean, I haven't noticed that before, but that must be his bugaboo. And so they were talking about his nose. And so they're singing a song about, the, the, you know, the song, he's written a song about that. He says, one's, one's the foot, one's the arm. He said, and I'm the nose, okay? He's the nose of Christianity. Whatever. But I love the, I love the verses here. Read them with me. There are diversities of gifts, but the same spirit. There are differences of ministries, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of activities, but it is the same God who works all in all. So none of us, we're not all the same thing. We have gifts and we have callings and we have how we look and what we think about and where we came from and how much money we make and what kind of car we drive and, and all those things. There are different duties in the body. In fact, can I read one more thing to you? I love this in 1 Corinthians 12. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and have been all made to drink of one spirit. For the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body either. If the whole body were an eye, where would be the sense of hearing? If the whole body were an ear, where would be the sense of smell? But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them, as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, yet one body. So again, the eye cannot say to the hand, I had no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. Now, those parts of the body that we think less honorable, we bestow the greater honor. And our unpresentable parts are treated with greater modesty, which our more presentable parts do not require. But God has so composed the body, giving greater honor to the part that lacked it, that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. So if one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. Now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. And that should take you through all kinds of bad stuff happening today. So the body is diverse, but it should never be divided. We see that here very clearly. And so he says back in the text, uh, 28, There is neither Jew nor Greek, neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female. You are all one in Christ Jesus. 
the gospel erases erases cultural barriers. You know, before you're anything else, you're a Christian. So you might be a Sox fan or a Cubs fan, but before you're that, you're a Jesus fan, right? Before anything else in your life, before being a man, men, you're a man of God, right? Before being a woman, ladies, you're a woman of God. Christ defines us. That's more important than any political view, any physical thing, any group we belong to, any social economic class. I'm a Christ follower. So it's neither Jew nor Greek. You don't have to become like any other culture because no culture is superior to any other culture. Why is that controversial in our society today? No culture is any better than any other culture or group or council of people. Because the gospel erases racial barriers and makes us one in him. The gospel erases class barriers, neither slave nor free. There are no economic levels in the church. There is no rich versus poor. There is no haves and have-nots. There is no us versus them. In, in chapter Acts, it said in the first church, all who believed were together and had all things in common. Class warfare, that's for the pundits on TV. Let it go. Envy of... Let it go. We're Christians. We're sons of God, and we are equal. The ground is level at the foot of the old rugged cross. And finally, it erases gender barriers, and that might be the, the biggest difficulty today, especially I was reading the other day that, uh, what was it when I was talking about Stephen? Someone's going to, Prince Harry's going to raise his kid gender fluid. That one I'd heard it, but there was, remember what it was? A, a gender, a was one word, like, like a, a gender tropical, I don't know what it was. Give me a break. Give me a break. But I'll tell you what, God loves us all the same. God loves people no matter what they are, and he wants to bring them to himself. So neither male nor female, uh, in the church, that's no big deal. Because we're one in Christ. Our duties may be different, but our value is the same. There is perfect equality in position, and our freedom in Christ through the promise that the gospel gives us changes our attitudes about everything in life. It does change your spending habits. It does change your politics. It does change how you treat your neighbors. It does change how you treat your spouse. It does change your grandparenting. It does change your shopping. Listen, it changes everything. I'm a son of God. That means something. And so we are heirs according to the promise, verse 29, and we're going to use that as a springboard next week. But listen, my friends, we have all these things because we are his adopted sons. He didn't adopt us as babies because babies can't talk. But we can talk right away. We can pray to God. We can praise the Lord. The moment you get saved, you're walking and leaping and praising God because you're an adopted son. as an adult son. And they can't they can't receive things, but you receive all the inheritance right now. He's given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. And you can't walk as a baby, but right immediately when you're saved, you're walking in Jesus, walking in the Spirit, because you're placed as an adult son, not a beautiful little, but not but, but helpless baby. That's what we have. And I wrote down here in my notes just to remind myself, Hallelujah! Let's pray. God in heaven, thank you so much that we are sons of God through faith in Christ. Thank you that we're not saved through anything that we do. Thank you that we're not saved through water. Otherwise, every time we take a shower, we're getting saved again. It's not about that. It's clearly not about that. And yet, Father God, you give us this opportunity through confessing with our mouth, through confessing through baptism, through confessing in the, in the life that we live, we can tell others what's happened in our hearts. And what's happened in our hearts is the most important thing. And our heart affects our head, affects our hands, affects our tongue. Father God, help us to never forget that we are already, if we've trusted in Christ, we are already fully sons of God. No one's greater, no one's worth. Billy Graham is no greater son than us. Because we're all in Jesus. And he's the important one. Please make that message clear to us as we sing, as we look forward to you coming back for us. In Jesus' name. Amen.